Hello everybody, welcome back. Good to see you again. I hope you're all well this Thursday and I hope that you are enjoying some good weather and <laughs> having a good time and that you are have had a chance to ask God to look at or to ask God to show you and um, where in your life he is busy setting the stage for redemption, restoration, breakthrough. I hope that you've asked him to show you a little bit because he doesn't show us everything, but just to reveal a little bit of what he's doing behind the scenes in the areas where you feel like he's not doing anything at all. <laughs> So I really hope that you have had that conversation with him and that you're excited to go through the rest of the book of Esther because it gets better from here on out. It really, really does. So I'm going to dive straight in. I'm just going to say thank you to all of those people who messaged me and let me know what God has been doing for them and um, all the, the stories about what he's shown you and how the stage has been set in your life for something incredible. And please, please, please always feel free to reach out to me. Give me a little bit of grace as to the length of time it takes me to respond. I sometimes have more time than others, but, um, but please feel free to contact me in any of the ways that it's possible to contact me. So we are moving on to Esther chapter 2. And in Esther chapter 2, we have the king, Xerxes or Ahasuerus. Um, he has now calmed down, sobered up, I think. He's so sobered up and he's calmed down. His, his wrath has been spent. And he now earnestly, it says actually his wrath has been pacified. And he now earnestly remembers Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. So it's almost like there's a bit of regret. Um, when I've looked a little bit more into the story, it's this seems to be his personality. He would um, drink a lot. He would fly off the handle. He would get angry. Um, he would make these decrees and these decisions. And um, obviously, at that time, you know, all his kind of trusted advisors and that they always agreed with him because, you know, he was the king. And if you disagreed with him, he would just have you killed. Um, so they would go along with whatever. And then when he calmed down and he was sober and his anger was over, then he would almost be like, why did you even allow that to happen? Or, you know, who said, who was the person who suggested? So I think he suddenly started thinking, oh, golly, what have I done? Um, he couldn't have been lonely because he had a whole lot of concubines, um, but he obviously needed a queen. You know, a king needs a queen, you know, in terms of royal standing and all of that sort of thing. So his servants, his ministers, whomever, who are now obviously wanting to appease him and not be held responsible for the fact that Vashti is no longer, um, come up with this brilliant plan. <laughs> And they say to him that why doesn't he, in, so instead of just choosing another queen from amongst the concubines he already has, why doesn't he let all the beautiful young virgins be brought before him and then he can choose a queen out of them? So that's what he does. He then appoints officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the capital in Shushan, to the harem. Now, bearing in mind what I said to you about the fact that once you had been in the harem as a concubine, you couldn't ever do anything else. So he already has concubines. Now he's adding as many of the beautiful young virgins as his officers and um, in all the provinces, in all 127 provinces of his kingdom can gather. And, you know, it just goes on to talk about how Esther is one of those people. But, I mean, have you ever stopped to think about what that was like? You know, Esther was a young Jewish girl. You know, they were young in those days. They, you know, they, they weren't, they were child brides often, they weren't waiting for them to be kind of, you know, mid-20s or something like that. We, you're looking at more sort of mid-teens, possibly even younger. And they, 
I don't know, you know, in some in some places it's it's written almost as if it was like some sort of beauty contest, you know, and you all entered and then someone won. At, you know, it, they were gathered and taken. It wasn't like they were given a choice. If if his if the king's officers saw a beautiful young virgin, um, th they were just taken. There was no kind of well, would, is there something you'd like to do? Is there something would you rather do something else? So I'm trying to just give you a picture of Esther as this young teenage girl um, being probably in more than likely, in all likelihood, forcibly removed from her uncle Mordecai and placed in the king's harem. And I think we need to, as we read the rest of the story, just bear that in mind, you know, that this wasn't something that she signed up for. This was something that went against everything she'd been raised to believe. So Mordecai was an Orthodox Jew. She was raised, he was, um, she was not his daughter, but he loved her like a daughter. She was his uncle's daughter and he was raising her because she was an orphan. He was raising her. So he had raised her to be Jewish with all the, you know. So this was not something she would have chosen to go and be a concubine in the king's harem that you know so i think we need to remember that that it was something that was forced on her and something that happened probably contrary to the way she thought her life would look i would imagine that she thought that she would marry a nice jewish boy and you know and live you know the life of a of a little jewish family maybe they had dreams of one day going back to jerusalem who knows but sometimes when we read the story we need to also put ourselves there and in that time and in that context and think of Esther, she was a person. You know, she was a girl, a young girl. Um, how did that feel for her? And for Mordecai, so now we have a certain Jew in the capital Shushan whose name is Mordecai and he was a Benjaminite, a Benjamite. And so Esther was a Benjamite which I found extremely interesting. So there's some things I'd like us to pay attention to. I'd like us to pay attention to the fact that if you read the book of Esther, in quite a few places, they specifically mention the month that things happened in. And I don't think that that's coincidence. And then the fact that they mention that Mordecai was a Benjamite. Look, I know that the Jewish people were identified as from the tribes that they came out of, so I understand that that's not hugely unusual. But I just want you to just bring back to memory um, the what we spoke about on the 12th of November last year when I released the teaching on the month of Kislev. And so we spoke about the month of Kislev being the month of Benjamin. And if you haven't seen that one, I would go back and watch it. And part of the Benjaminite, Benjamite, what encompassed a Benjamite was warfare strategies, prophetic revelations for war, and courage and ferocity. I think sometimes we think of Esther as this timid little sweet thing, um, but she must have had ferocious courage to do what she did, even just to be able to got, be forcibly removed and taken to King Xerxes' um, harem without you know, completely losing the plot. I mean, that took courage and ferocity. And she didn't even know yet, but God was going to give her and Mordecai warfare strategies. He was going to give them prophetic revelation. And I think that that is associated with the fact that they come from the tribe of Benjamin. And that was part of the anointing on the tribe of Benjamin. It was part of what the tribe of Benjamin carried because they could have, she could have come from any tribe. Specifically, she came from the tribe of Benjamin. And I think it's a good time to just reiterate the fact that God doesn't do anything willy-nilly. You know, he doesn't just throw things in the air and like see where the chips settle. He's very intentional. So if, 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 if she came from the tribe of Benjamin, there was a reason for that. That wasn't just, oh, oh, she was from the tribe of Benjamin. I didn't realize that when I chose her. No, no, he knew. And I think it was because, or I'm absolutely convinced, it was because of what the tribe of Benjamin carried at that time in terms of their warfare strategies and their courage and ferocity. So off she goes. 
and she is taken let's say she's beautiful and lovely and um many maidens were gathered in shushan under the custody of haggai which was one of um king xerxes uh, eunuchs he was in charge of all the women which is why he was a eunuch and um and she is taken into the king's house, into the custody of Hegai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased Hegai and obtained his favor. This is Esther 2 verse 9. And I want you to also, when you read through Esther, I want you to underline for yourself how many times it references the fact that either Esther or Mordecai or the Jewish people found favor. So Esther's here, forcibly removed, taken into this palace, into this harem, with a whole lot of other girls who probably weren't um, Jewish. They were from all different, you know. Um, it's very much a, not a Jewish, you know, not sanctified, not holy, not anything like that. And yet, instead of being, you know, completely you know, just kicking and screaming or throwing tantrums or woe is me or, you know, God has forgotten about me, I'm going to slit my wrists. She obtains Hagar's favor. She is what, who are ever, and I don't think, I think sometimes we see that as the fact that she was all timid and sweet as pie. I'm sure she probably was very sweet, but I don't think she was timid. I think that there was a strength and a courage to her and, and, and a godliness probably because she'd been raised as a, as a Jew, um, that, that appealed to Hegai, even though he didn't know that that was what it was. So she must have carried herself with a courage. And so what that meant is that he gave her the things for her purification and her portion of food. So Esther didn't eat the way they ate in the palace. She stuck to the Jewish diet. She stuck to the, the, the way, the lifestyle of the Jewish people in terms of what they were supposed to eat and what they weren't supposed to eat. And she was, she had maids to be given her and he gave her an, a, a, the best apartment in the harem. So she had all of this, but I mean, she was still in the harem. Um, and she didn't, she hadn't told anybody that she was Jewish because Mordecai had charged her not to do so. In my opinion, the whole way through Esther, Mordecai is the prophet. You know, if you want to look at the players, the, the, the actors and actresses in the story that is Esther, you can actually assign a current role to them if you look at our circumstances as the church in the world. And you can actually do that. And maybe I'll do that at the end. But Mordecai definitely is a prophet in this book of Esther, without a doubt. So he's told her not to tell them she's a Jew. And obviously that's because the Jews were persecuted and they weren't loved. And he was worried about what would happen if she did tell them she was a Jew. But it all still played into the story that God was unfolding. And then, I mean, so for 12 months, one whole year, they all the girls go through all of this um, beauty treatment, you know, all of this six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet spices and perfumes and the things for the purifying of women. And, you know, for 12 months, I mean, honestly, so it took 12 months for them to be purified enough and beautiful enough and all the rest of it to actually even let the king possibly entertain them. I mean, in this day and age of instant gratification, I don't know that that would work for any of us. And so she goes through all of this. And then what happens with the concubines is that the king calls one of them and they go into the king. And if he likes her, he will call her again at some other stage. If he doesn't like her, he will never call her again. And she will spend the rest of her life until she dies in the harem, never doing another thing. Okay, that's the, the possible fate. So when it comes for Esther's turn to go before the king, she doesn't take, so they were allowed to take whatever they wanted to out of the palace, you know, I presume adornments, jewelry, blah, 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 to go and see the king. And Esther, very wise, very, very wise, again, just a prophetic revelation happening there. She takes only what Hegai, the eunuch, suggested she take. So she was wise enough to ask 
to ask advice on what she should actually take with her to see the king. And again, it says here, it's chapter 2, verse 15. And Esther won favor in the sight of all who saw her. So in other words, she chose only what Hegai suggested because he probably knew the king better than anybody else. And she went with what he had said and she won the favor of all who saw her. Everybody. And then it says that she was taken to King Xerxes into his royal palace in the 10th month, the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. And I was just interested to have a look and see the month of Tibet. Um, Tibet, actually, it says Tibet in the Amplified. Well, it's Tibet, Tibet, you know. But that is the month of Dan. And it is the month of um, authority judgment. Um, it is the month of focus. It's a month of, um, it says it's a good time to fast and purify, which was what she'd just been doing. And it is a month to pay attention to prophetic words and to war when God calls you and stand for your inheritance and not back down. Now, obviously, Esther didn't know that this was what was going to happen. But I cannot think that God would send her in to the king. I think that it, that he works in appointed times and appointed seasons, and he has appointed times and seasons for things, and that he would have chosen a month that, that brings with it all of these other connotations for her to go into the king. So she was always, she was always ahead of the curve. And bearing in mind as well that she was a good, a good, she'd been raised as a good Jew. She was a good Jewish girl. So she would have known all of that. You know, she would have known what the month of Tibet meant. She would have known, it, she would have known all of those things because she'd been raised and taught about the Jewish things by Mordecai. So she goes into him on the month of Tibet. And he, that says in chapter 7, uh, verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the maidens, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So she found favor with all, with the eunuch, with everyone who saw her, and then with the king, he loved her better than everyone else. And he loved her so much that he gave a great feast and lessened taxes. <laughs> and gave gifts. That's how much he loved her. And she still hadn't, she still hadn't revealed that she was a Jew. And I just want to read chapter, verse 20, where it says, now Esther had not yet revealed her nationality or her people, for she obeyed Mordecai's command to her to fear God and execute his commands, just as when she was being brought up by him. So that just tells the story that she was raised to fear God and execute his commands. And do you think that there might have been something in her that was like, I've been raised to fear God and execute his commands and this is where I land up. Like this is what, this is where I am. And now, you know, where purification and um, holiness and righteousness meant so much to the Jewish people. And now she has to be joined to this king who is none of those things. You know, she she has to give herself, her most intimate self, to this man who doesn't represent any of the things that she's been raised to believe in. Do you think she could have been like, God, you know, what is going on? Why would you do this? Do you think there could have been times when she questioned? There must have been. She was just human. There must have been. But still, she, she listened to Mordecai, and still, she, she didn't reveal herself because she feared God and executed his commands. I just think that that's absolutely amazing. And then, at the end of the chapter, uh, at the end of the chapter, yes, it so happens that Mordecai, who actually is an attendant in the king's court, so he is part of the king's kind of goings on and so he does get to walk past the harem and you know make sure Esther's okay and all of that sort of thing but he happens to be sitting at the king's gate and he overhears two eunuchs who were angry with King Xerxes and they are now plotting to kill him and Mordecai then tells Esther and Esther tells the king and the king investigates and finds out that it is actually true they are were plotting to kill him and both the men are hanged 
Um, so they are then that is all recorded in the book of Chronicles. So it's not the book of Chronicles as the book of Chronicles that's in the Bible. It's the book of Chronicles, King Xerxes book of Chronicles, which recorded all the happenings like in the royal court and all the decisions he made and the things that happened, blah, 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 in his, and he had a book of everything that was captured there. So the so Esther has found favor with the king. He loves her more than anyone. She's his favorite. Um, and the benefit for the king of the fact that he has chosen Esther, God's choice, as his favorite is that now his an assassination attempt is avoided because Mordecai actually gets to hear about what's going on here and he gets to pass that on to Esther and she gets to tell the king. And what's amazing to me is also that with this, where she had to tell the king about the two eunuchs who wanted to kill him, it doesn't say anything about how she got an audience with him. So one can only assume that it so happened that she actually was, you know, seeing the king and she could tell him at the same time. And so she didn't have to go through the whole process like she does later when she has to stand for the Jews. So those two men were, um, were hanged. And I suppose by this point in time, you know, Esther and Mordecai could sort of be thinking, okay, this could all work out. You know, this 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 all looks like actually it could be what God intended. They probably didn't know why, and they probably still had questions in their mind about what it was that God was trying to do here. But there was probably a degree of um a degree of uh pride or you know that that Esther was queen. Although if, if she hadn't told anybody she was Jewish, I mean, it makes you wonder whether the other Jews knew she was Jewish, but they must have. And um, so there must have been something about the fact, there must have been rumblings or stirrings or or amongst the Jewish people themselves about the fact that here was Esther, um, a Jewish girl who had now been made queen of Persia. And, um, and Mordecai was in the court. And I wonder what some of those rumblings would have sounded like. You know, like I wonder whether every Jewish person who lived in Persia in exile, far from home, possibly, you know, I don't know how poverty stricken they were, but I don't think life in exile was ever easy. Um, you know, I wonder if they all were like, oh, we're so thrilled that one of our own is queen. Or if they were like, oh my goodness, like they can't be real Jews. How could they allow that to happen? And she should have fallen on her sword or she should have, you know, done something differently to make sure that she wasn't compromised by becoming queen or, um, you know, Mordecai, how could Mordecai allow that to happen? And he's right in there in the king's court. So how could he call himself a Jew when he mixes with, you know, all of these people? I'm sure that there were loads of Jewish people who were really proud of Esther. And I'm also sure that there were some who couldn't have cared less and didn't even know. Um, I'm sure that that just is representative of the world that we live in, of even the body of believers that we're a part of, you know. Um, but I've got to wonder, because I think we often imagine, um, you know, when Esther kind of stood up for the Jews, we sort of imagine that they were this band of tightly knit people who all loved and supported each other and would have, you know, and I, I don't know so much. I mean, they were people, you know, they were human beings, and there were some good, some bad, some ugly. You know, they weren't all perfect. They, they weren't all. So um, when Esther stood up for the Jewish people, she didn't say, I'm just standing up for the ones who've supported me. I'm only standing for the tribe of Benjamin. I'm only standing for, you know, she stood up for all the Jews, no matter what they thought of her, no matter what they'd possibly said about her, no matter what um, they had, you know, what Mordecai had heard. I mean, there must have been other relations. There must have been other opinions. You know, there must have been a lot of that going around. Um, but that that didn't stop her from doing what she did. You know, she didn't say, can I pick the ones I save? <laughs> Which sometimes I think some of us, we would be like, okay, can I just choose, you know? So now the stage is even more set. We have the king, we have Mordecai, we have Esther firmly established in the king's favor. Um, we have Mordecai, who has actually now saved the king from assassination, and so he's also been recorded, you know, as that auspicious deed. So if you can imagine a play, and you can imagine, you know, the 
if you've ever been in a play and you all take your positions on the stage, you know, and just before you, they've opened the curtain. So we've had the first act and Vashti has come on and gone off. And now we're getting ready for the second act and all the different um, players are taking their place on the stage and getting ready for the curtain to open on what the next act. And God is behind every single bit of it. So, Read Esther chapter 2. We were supposed to be going through this so much faster than we are, but this is going to be obviously a few more weeks than I thought it would be because there's just so much. But read Esther chapter 2. Pray about it. Talk to the Lord about it. Ask Him again. To ask Him to show you the main characters in the areas of your life that you need breakthrough. Show Him where they fit and where they don't fit and uh, let me know what He says. I'm going to go now and I shall see you next week. Bye.